As a diabetic, what should our blood sugar levels be after eating? When should we test our blood sugars and how much of a movement would we want after a meal for optimal health? Are many of the latest diabetic studies flawed when it comes to our long-term health and blood sugar levels? Today, you will understand the incredibly important key to the puzzle. These studies and your doctor may be missing. If healing your body and remaining complication-free is your single biggest goal, then grasping and controlling this missing link is, if not more important, than blood glucose levels. But before we begin, let me welcome all you resilient diabetics out there. This is the channel we turn ordinary, struggling diabetics into extraordinary well control diabetics. If you don't know who I am and you are brand new to this channel, I welcome you. My name is Jay Sapat and I am an insulin dependent diabetic diagnosed a little over six years ago. So the proud owner of a pancreas that's gone on a permanent and lifelong vacation. So not only am I a diabetic just like you, where we will be walking that walk and talking that talk together, but I do also have a University of Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition Dietetics, and that comes in very handy in discussing all the intricacies of being a diabetic. My goal is to put four years of chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, and human physiology into a 10 minute or so presentation so that you know how your diabetic body works better than dare I say your doctor? I sure did. The unique information presented today will only be found here on The Resilient Diabetic. New, life-changing episodes are generally released weekly. So if you want to learn more and you want to be notified by YouTube that a new video has been published, then the only way to do that is to first hit that subscribe button followed by the gray notification bell. Then choose turn on all notifications. And of course, if you liked and you enjoyed what you saw and heard today, please hit that like button. The leading cause of kidney failure and blindness is now due to the explosion of diabetes. The sheer number of new kidney dialysis centers popping up across the country to service both non-compliant and just importantly misinformed diabetics is absolutely mind-blowing and disheartening. I hate to say this, but it's only going to get worse. What is hard for many to fathom that there are many patients who've completely lost their eyesight and kidneys within two years of diagnosis because they simply did not respond and or care until it was too late. What is one of the first hardened rules there is in diabetes? What is done is done and there's no going back. Diabetes is a unique disease and I've said this before, being diagnosed as a diabetic can be a blessing in disguise. What, you may be asking yourself, what do I mean by that? Unlike other diseases where you have no control over death, further complications and related diseases, that's a whole lot of suffering. Our bodies, once diagnosed, have essentially shown us our cards in life. No other diseases allows for this. It is communicating back to us we can either live a full, long, healthy life or begin this downward spiral of extreme health issues. Everyone else will be caught off guard. But you see, your body wants to live and it sent you direct signs of what it wants and what is directly killing it. It has given you a crossroads or a choice. Take it or leave it, point blank. So what is it saying? Our bodies as designed cannot consume all these carbohydrates, both good and bad, at a rate our modern society does. So cut it back and most importantly, take charge. And if you do take charge and you understand some physiological basics, you can and you will outlive your peers with no remarkable damage if caught early. Now, this is one of the important components every diabetic should know first, because this is where the first piece of the puzzle comes in. What are the normal blood sugar ranges for those without diabetes? Fasting blood sugars in the morning before eating are between 70 to 90 milligrams a deciliter. One hour after a meal, it's generally between 90 to 130 milligrams deciliter. Five or more hours after eating, 
it is back to that baseline of 70 to 90 milligrams a deciliter. Let me repeat this because this is so critical. Five or more hours after eating, it is back to that baseline of 70 to 90 milligrams a deciliter. During the day, levels tend to be their lowest just before a meal. Now, what about us diabetics? Well, our goalpost gets moved. Depending on your doctor, your exact diagnosis, your health condition, and even your age, they would want your fasting plasma glucose levels between 80 and 130 milligrams a deciliter, and your two-hour post-meal levels to be around 180 milligrams a deciliter or less. Type 1 or type 1 point diabetics such as myself that are insulin dependent generally have a higher threshold due to the fear of hypoglycemia. So let's talk about the studies and where the experts, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know where these experts stand when it comes to blood sugars. So in essence, these experts do agree that it's generally helpful for people with diabetes to lower their blood sugar levels. However, there is still a huge debate about how low it should be. On the one hand, the aim is to prevent diabetes-related complications. But on the other hand, the side effects of treatment such as low blood sugars. The problem, and I'm getting ahead of myself, is both the treatment and the diet at the same time. And I will give you an example. There is a study known as the Veterans Affairs Diabetes Trial. This trial tested over 1,700 military veterans with type 2 diabetes. The men and women veterans who were tested were on insulin and or a maximum dose of oral agents, and they were uncontrolled. The purpose was to see whether lowering blood sugar levels more aggressively would help in reduce the risk of metabolic diseases such as heart attacks and improve their quality of life and, of course, the cost effectiveness of the treatment. The subjects were randomized into two groups, the first to achieve normal A1C levels or a second group for just an improved glycemic control. This is what I want you to pay attention to. Both control groups received steep therapy, meaning more oral agents and or the addition of insulin to achieve the goals. The initial results, which were previously published after 10 years of follow-up, showed that tight blood sugar control reduced the risk of heart events by 17%. After a total of 10 years, the risk for heart events was significantly lower amongst those with tight blood sugar control versus those in the standard control. However, the new updated study found that these benefits went away after the additional five-year follow-up. In fact, once participants in both groups had similar A1C levels following the intervention, those in the tighter blood sugar control group actually had higher cardiovascular risk than those in the standard control. Authors noted that this may be due to the fact that tight glucose control is often associated with weight gain, which increases the risk for heart and health problems. So what did they miss? What went wrong? And it's staring them right in the face. Their diet model is built around a high carb intake, a food guide pyramid style with high amounts of starches, breads, grains, fruits, cereals. So that also means high amounts of drugs to treat the high amounts of carbs. Why the weight gain over time? Due to the high amounts of insulin required to be taken or to be produced by the body, which then increases metabolic risk. Our esteemed experts to this day cannot put this simple link together. The amounts of insulin needed is just as important, if not more, to the health of the human body. Too much insulin creates inflammation inside our bodies. It is what's directly killing us. We simply cannot add more and more medications to put out the fire. Why again? Because our institutions who are not subject to change first set the standards of the high carbohydrate diet and then treat the patients with this corresponding amounts of excessive medications. This is what separates the resilient diabetic and why you are subscribed. The sheer number of personal emails coming in on how this channel has helped you is astonishing. You've realized, like in the video, can diabetics eat sweet potatoes? A food our beloved institutions call a superfood. 
or an antibiotic food is just the opposite for you. It requires you to use more medications and you will have even less blood sugar control than say eating cruciferous vegetables and possibly carrots. So in order to break these health repercussions diabetes brings, one not only has to control blood sugar levels within a tight range, but at the same time, lower the amounts of insulin needed or to be produced by the human body. They must come together. And how is that done? By lowering carbohydrates through modified food choices. Knowing this now, what is the gold standard of glucose control? What is my goal? It is actually similar to what a non-diabetic blood sugars would look like. I call it the full circle model. Notice again, their blood sugar levels always return to that baseline and blood sugars remain relatively flat. We do not want these violent swings back and forth where it's 190 one minute, 65 the next hour, and then back up to 150 an hour later. The damage that is occurring to the body with these violent swings is insurmountable. So let's look at some examples when it comes to blood sugar charts. The first few are your volatile ones. The first one is from one of my type 1 diabetic Instagram followers who happens to be very, very young. And you can see he is struggling. All of his daily logs actually look like this. And you'd think that his healthcare team would help him make some critical adjustments. In the second chart, you can see a bigger picture log of a type 2 diabetic that is on multiple insulins, a bolus and a basal, along with multiple oral medications. They have in her use heavy amounts of fast acting insulin to the recommended high carbohydrate food guide pyramid intake of foods. That is the breads, the rice, the starches, the snacks and such, quote unquote, the healthy carbs. And this makes me cringe because as you can see, this roller coaster of blood sugars causing severe damage, both mentally and physically, even though the average may not reflect that. What you can see and see immediately is that it sometimes becomes impossible to match the peak of insulin especially the fast acting insulins to when food peaks through the process of digestion and absorption, especially if the wrong carbs are consumed. It is just far too difficult to do. And as you know already, and you've been following me, I've tried that approach. And this is where walking that walk separates all the experts who just talk the talk. Consuming the carbs our institutional experts recommend will make it difficult, if not impossible, to keep your blood glucose levels level and flatline, especially for those of you who are like me who have to use insulin. Now, this chart is closer to what I want to see. The left is not quite flatline, but within the target ranges. Your right chart shows a movement out of the range, but then is corrected to within the range that jump could have easily been due to a stressful event. Your single most important job as a diabetic is to find those combination of foods your body tolerates, your body enjoys, that keeps you not only full and satisfied, but using the least amount of medications and insulin at the same time to keep your blood sugar levels as flat as possible. And what are those foods? I'll create a playlist for you in the description box below and at the end of the video for you to review. Second, I want you to test and I want you to test some more. If you're a newly diagnosed diabetic, ask your doctor for the most amount of test strips possible. Test prior to each meal and then one hour later and then two hours later. What you want is the least amount of blood sugar movement possible. For example, I have my routine where my waking numbers are in the low 100s and I'm able to keep my blood sugars to no higher than 120 to 130 for a few hours and then it comes back down into the 90 to 100 range. So I have a relatively flat line all day long. What have I noticed from many of the subscribers who follow this channel is that once you make these modifications, not only have your medication requirements been drastically dropped, but you've noticed something very, very special your mood and your emotional stability has also stabilized as blood sugars have flatlined. Yes, folks, that is one of the side effects of following these videos. You feel great all day long. And the other side effect, body fat is mysteriously shedding and is magically disappearing. 
If you have not already, you need to get a journal. When you finish the blood glucose checks, write down your results and note what factors may have affected them, such as what foods were eaten, the amounts, your activity levels, and most importantly, stress. Take a close look at your blood glucose records and see if your levels are too high or too low several days in a row at the same time. If the same thing keeps happening, it might be a time to change the plans. Even though you've taken the reins or in full control, you still have to work with your doctor and your diabetic education team. As you modify your diet and your lifestyle, your medications will have to be adjusted. Do ask your doctor if you should report results that are out of the range right away by either email or by phone. See if phone consultations are available for ease and convenience. But just as importantly, please keep in mind that blood glucose results often trigger strong emotional feelings. Blood glucose numbers can leave you upset, confused, frustrated, angry, or just straight down. It's easy to use the numbers to judge ourselves. Remember, we are just human and numbers will not always be perfect. Perfection in diabetes is not always possible. We must always accept the fact diabetes is a lifelong learning lesson that is both dynamic and forever changing. I'll create that important playlist for you on more videos related to blood sugar control and foods that we as diabetics can either eat or drink. In the list, start with vegetables for diabetes. My top three picks. What are the best vegetables for diabetics? I'll not only give you my top three picks, but the criteria used to determine that list. These are not only the healthiest, but also low in carbohydrates, rich in vitamins and minerals, fiber, and antioxidants. These are my go-to everyday staple of carbohydrate sources that easily keep my blood sugars low and control thus an A1C in the low fives but most importantly, aids in keeping me strong and energetic all day long. If you're on your desktop or laptop, use that mouse to click that box. If you're on your mobile device, tap that with your fingers. The first is the link to subscribe to this important channel. The second, the link to all the important playlists. So have a great and productive day and we'll see you soon with another new episode, which I've said are always released weekly. Bye for now.